my worldview says there's a rational God who created you and me with a rational mind. And the reason that that makes more sense than your worldview is, is because I have found that my rational mind picks up reality. Wow, isn't that amazing that I have a rational mind that can understand reality? Do you think that that rational mind is an accident? Yes. No. It's far more reasonable to believe that this rational mind is the gift of a rational creator than to believe that this rational mind is an accident. No, it you doesn't. You follow that? Come on, guys, think. Sir, it has to do with us not having to be a nomadic culture and finally learning how to cultivate animals and farm and be able to stay in a place for a certain amount of time so we can raise our families and have more time to think rather than scavenging for food. Men would go out to hunt, women would take care of children, men would come back and spend time with their families, more interactive time with children. Children would grow, become smarter, and become better than their parents. That is what life is about, being a better example than your parents before you. That is all my parents have ever told me. Very good. Have a better life than they okay, ever had. Okay, good. Now, who defines better? Who defines Social better? Contrast. Social contrast. Social exactly. Very okay, good. Said, man. So if you happen to grow up in a Nazi home, social contract says Aryans are superior to Jews. That's a social contract. If you happen to be African American at the time of the Dred Scott decision, social contract in America says Black folks are three-fifths of value of white folks. You know, Do you what? like those social contracts? Uh, no, I don't, because I was Good. raised Catholic. I was raised Catholic, and I never subscribed to that social contract. <laughs> I never did. I never liked the church because come on, I... Come on, guys, think. Think. It was a very punishing... punishing. If, if morality is based on the social contract, what do you say if you're a white South African at the time of apartheid? What do you say if you're a Nazi at the time of Adolf Hitler? Speak against it. Okay, good. So you don't follow the social contract, do you? What do you follow? You make your own. You make your own. How do you make your own? Logic. 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 Okay, and what else? Reason. Heart, reason, conscience. You know that to dump on another person because they're a different race is evil. It's disrespectful of that human being. Well, why is a human being valuable? Why is it wrong to be disrespectful? Because that human being is not an accident. That human being has been created by God for a purpose. Because they have purpose, they have meaning. Because they have meaning, they have value. And that value comes from God. You wipe God out of the picture. You're up a creek without a paddle when it comes to explaining why human beings have value. Survival. 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 Good. Survival. Good try. They don't Survival. have real value. Thank you. They, they don't, don't have real value. value. So this man, you don't have real value, neither does this man. We just create that in our heads. Why should we base the contextual evidence that it presents any different than the contextual evidence off of a Dr. Seuss book or John Steinbeck's uh, Grapes of Wrath? It's just context. It, we don't know it really happened. Okay. Great question. Sir, I am not asking you to accept the Bible as the Word of God. Okay, so let's get that straight, okay? I think it's ridiculous for me to say, well, the Bible's the Word of God. There's no way I could show that, so forget that, okay? What I am asking you to accept is the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as historically reliable. Okay. In other words, I am convinced that the evidence is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are a historical narrative that is reliable. It'll give you an accurate picture of who Jesus was. Okay. Now, is that a problem? Or can you accept that as historically uh, accurate? I don't have enough time to check the like credibility, but I'm sure they're pretty credible from your, uh, what you're saying. They sound pretty credible. So, How long were they written after the disciples? Yeah, yeah. Great question. The, the Gospels were written, the Gospels were written within 20 to 60 years after Christ which means they were written by eyewitnesses or by those who knew eyewitnesses of Christ. I don't think it's wise of you to trust me. Well, yeah, I just, right? I don't have any direction, so you I'm bet. trying to find which way to go. Okay, I'll, well, thank you for your honesty. I appreciate it and respect that. All right, now just let me share with you how I did it. Okay. Nothing sacred about the way I did it, yeah. but I would plead with you, you got to come up with your own tests. 
that you use to determine whether a document, any document, is historically reliable or not. You've got a history department right there, right? You guys got to pay money to take history courses. So obviously you respect it as a, a branch of knowledge. Okay, here are my four tests that I use on Suetonius, Tacitus, Homer, the Gospels, the Quran, the history of Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, American history, African history, South American history, Chinese history. It's the following, four tests. What is the literary style of the document? Now you see, what's fascinating is, some of you guys don't have the foggiest idea what I've just said, but you do it. Unconsciously, you do what I just said. What I just said is, respect literary style. And some of you are thinking, what? What's that? When you go to biology class, do you read a biology textbook the same way you read the plays of William Shakespeare? Good. That's an example of respecting literary style. You know that science textbook, scientific writing, is not the same as a play by William Shakespeare. Do you read a play of William Shakespeare the same way you would read a poem? Nope. Do you read a poem the same way you would read a math textbook? Nope. Okay, that all that what that is. You're respecting literary style. So, you obviously have to learn what is the literary style of historical narrative. Historical narrative is concerned with what such questions as, at what time did this take place? At what place did this take place? And who were the people around to witness this event take place? That's historical narrative. Second test, internal consistency. At 224, Thursday, November 1st, Cliff was in San Marcos, Texas. Later on in the document, at 224 on November 1st, Cliff was in Calcutta, India. Contradiction. The author's mixed up. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will see there's no contradictions. Are there different perspectives? Yes. Tonight, I'm going to call my wife up in Connecticut. I'm going to say, I talked to a very respectful man, a very intelligent man, who had a Texas State shirt on. Later on in the conversation, I'm going to say, I spoke to over 50 people. Is that a contradiction? No. If you said, said at the same instance, then it would have been a contradiction. Well, not even so. Because oh, well, when I was talking with you, oh, 50 people oh, yeah, were listening, right? Yes. See, so okay. it's, it's perspective. Yeah. Okay? So you got to keep that one clear in your head when it comes to contradiction. Okay, so the first test is literary style. The second test is internal consistency. The third test is archaeology. What does that mean? On November 1st, 2012, Cliff spoke to students on the island of Atlantis. What? Where is the island of Atlantis? It's fictitious, right? So, was Jesus born on the island of Atlantis? No, he was born in Bethlehem. Grew up in Nazareth, went to Jerusalem, floated a boat, not on the Sea of Orpheus, no, on the Sea of Galilee. Archaeologically verifiable places. Okay, that's a third test to determine whether a historical document is reliable. Here's the fourth test. Now, now catch this one, because some of you guys have already raised this this week, and I'm glad you did, which is, come on, man, you ever playing a game telephone? You sit in a circle, whisper a secret in the ear of the person next to them, they whisper it in the ear of the person next to them, and by the time that secret reaches the end of the circle, it's totally changed. I was gonna raise that point. Good. Okay, that's important, isn't it? Yeah. Okay? So th that's the fourth test. Manuscript evidence, which is great with this guy raised who just left. Okay. How big is the gap between Jesus living and the written records? Very important question. It used to be taught on every state university campus in the United States, in the religion department, that the Gospels were not written for two, three, four hundred years after Christ. But what happened was, we have discovered so many Greek early manuscripts that we know that that's false. The Gospels were not written two, three hundred, four hundred years after Christ. They were all written between two, twenty, and sixty years after Christ. How do we know that? Well, we got a fragment of the Gospel of John, dated between 115 and 130 AD in the John Rylands Museum in Manchester, England. 
So you see that one manuscript find smashed that whole school of thought that taught the Gospels weren't written for a few hundred years. Then we discovered the writings of the early church fathers, like Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, who in 95 AD writes letters, and in these letters he quotes Matthew, Mark, Luke. In other words, at 95 AD, those letters were obviously already written because he's quoting him in his letters. See, that's why we know that those Gospels were written in the first century. Now, the Gospels that we have in English today, sir, are based on over 5,200 Greek manuscripts or pieces of manuscript. That is why we have such a high degree of certainty that we really have what those eyewitnesses wrote. If we, the, the Iliad comes closest to it, and the Iliad has something like 600 manuscripts. But for the New Testament, over 5,000. So if anybody gives you the old telephone stuff, they just don't know what they're talking about. We don't have the New Testament by telephone from the French and Spanish versions. We have the Greek manuscripts, over 5,000, all agreeing to an infinitesimal degree. So we really have what those guys wrote. You owe it to yourself as a thinking human being. Read the gospel simply as history. Forget about it being the word of God. You don't know that. And ask yourself, does the historical evidence of the way Jesus lived, taught, died, and rose from the dead point to him being a fraud if it does reject him? Or does it point to him being the truth if it does embrace him? Put your faith in it. I just have one more short question. Yeah, uh, go ahead. The other, the other conflict I have is um, I realized a lot of theism, not uh, necessarily, but most of the time, it always uh, is accompanied by afterlife. And the thing I don't understand with that is most humans are scared of 2,400 because they will not be alive. Right. And my uh, interpretation is consciousness wants to maintain itself and the idea of not existing kind of just defeats the purpose. So I always tell my friends, uh, were you scared of 1876 when you didn't exist? And then they'll say no. And then I'll say, why, why would you be scared of 2,400? You won't exist. You don't remember it. You're not aware of it. And no one's ever been able to really retort to that. You bet. So I don't, I mean, I've had one person say it's after God builds a relationship with you. But it, I mean, I really haven't found anything that's been solid that kind of made me question it. So. Okay. Good. Okay. The reason that I'm not concerned about Cliff in 1876 is because I was not alive then. So you're right. That doesn't matter to me. But since May 20th, 1954, when I was born, sorry to give you an idea of how old I am. <laughs> since then, I have been keenly concerned about Cliff's life. Now, often people say, well, that's just selfishness on your part, Cliff, that you're concerned about your life. No, it is not selfishness. It's an affirmation of the value of my life. Now, if you get really sick, you're going to go to the best doctor you can. because you have, Not because you're selfish, but because you affirm the value of your life. Why are you and I not going to go out and play out on traffic on I-35? It's not because we're selfish. Yeah. It's because we don't want to end up on the bumper of a car or a truck because we affirm the value of our life. Our life is good. We don't want to end it by getting crushed by a truck or a car. Okay, why am I interested in you living life after death? Why am, I, why am I interested in living life after death? Not because I'm selfish, but I celebrate life. I affirm the value of your life and my life. And therefore, if there is life after death, I'm keenly interested in it. If there's no life after death, fine, we gotta face the fact there's no life after death. But because I affirm life, I wanna get you to the best doctor possible if you get really sick. And because I affirm the value of your life, I also am keenly interested in you living for eternity in heaven. And to tell you the truth, sir, that, that's what motivates me partially to be out here to talk. Because yeah. I affirm life. I think you guys are great. I want you to experience eternal life. I'm convinced that Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins, which leads to death, but he rose from the dead. That's why I trust that him talking about life after death is not just him doing this and blowing smoke. He's speaking the truth. That's why putting our faith in Christ is so important. 
because my mind is I'm not going to blindly have faith in something unless I can see the evidence that it's there. Good. You said before I accept anything, I need evidence. Okay, I'm tracking with you. I'm just the same way you are, okay? Before I believe anything, I need evidence. But now, the question becomes, how much evidence, what kind of evidence do you need in order to believe that God exists? I would need scientific evidence, and how much of it is really dependent on each individual person. Okay. I mean, you can't measure, like, for me it could be, I'm just going to use a number like, I need 100% evidence, or someone else it could be, they need 80% evidence. Okay. Okay, the reason I ask that question, Justin, is because I have no scientific evidence that love is real. It's an unseen, intangible value. It's chemical reactions firing in our brain. Okay, good. Then if I love you, it means I have to love you because there are chemical reactions firing in my brain, and so I have to love you. Is that right? Okay, but my experience contradicts that, Justin. My experience is I don't have to love you. I could hate you, exactly. or I could just blow you off, be apathetic. Yeah, it's emotions, and those are chemical reactions in our brain. They, they know, like, they've done research to say what chemicals control what emotions and what part of the brain. Okay. I would insist my love for you is not an emotion. Why? Because I define love the same way Jesus did, which means to make a decision of the will to pray for your well-being, to wish your well-being, and to do things that promote your well-being. You see, when Jesus says, love your enemy, he's not saying, have good feelings for your enemy. To be honest with you, Justin, I don't have good feelings towards my enemy. But I obey Jesus and love my enemy by actively wishing their well-being. So you see, love, I would argue, is not just an emotion. Yes, there's an emotion we call love. But when Christ says to love, he's not talking about having all these positive feelings. Because guess what? I can't command my feelings. And if someone has hurt me deeply enough, I don't have a lot of positive feelings towards them. But I can love them, which means I can pray for their success, I can wish their success, and I can work for their success. So our definitions of love are different. Exactly. So we gotta, I think we've got to be real careful there. Why isn't this God providing for people in poverty? That's, that's my big thing. Like, there's so much suffering going on in this world. Why would you want to worship a God who is allowing that to happen? Okay. I mean, if he, does all the, if he did all the things like the Bible said, what is keeping him from doing them now? Okay, good question. The only reason that suffering is really bad is because you know what really good is. In other words, evil is real. It's an objective value. And good is real. It's an objective value. It's not just relative. It's not subjective. And that's why I like what you're protesting. You're protesting, come on Cliff, how can God exist in light of all the evil and suffering in the world? But you see, if there is no God, Justin, there is no evil. There is no good other than a subjective prejudice, a taste, a bias, an opinion. You see, the reason that evil is wrong is because it's objectively wrong. And the reason that good is good is, is because it's objectively good. It's not just subjective, depending on my opinion. It's objective, which means it's independent of you and me. You're absolutely right, sir. Suffering is wrong. Starvation is wrong. Evil is wrong objectively, not just subjectively. And the only reason that's true is, is because there's a God who has created and defined a value of goodness and justice and compassion. And those are real. They're not just a biochemical reaction. Then why would he make, then why would he make evil? Okay. If it's all part of his plan, why would he include suffering and everything in his plan? And Good you're question. if there's free will, which I'm pretty sure is what you're gonna go towards. Yes. Then he, why we create a divine plan then if you're going to give us free will? But if there is a divine plan and he knew ahead of time what we were going to do, then that's not really free will either. Okay, good questions. Let's say you've been dating her for the past two months. Let's say that every week she's said to you, I love you. 
Then tonight your dad calls you up and says, Justin, I've been paying her $1,000 a week to love you. How would you feel? I would feel creeped out that she said it was in the first two months. Good. <laughs> you'd be bummed out, wouldn't you? You'd be bummed out because you'd realize her love was not a free decision. Her love was paid for by my dad. See, in order to be real, love has to be free. If it's paid for, if it's coerced or forced, it's not real. It's not really love. Right? Well, I just said you, you could pay me to go around preaching that God is real, and I don't believe it. It's the same thing. Good point. If, if I'm out here simply to make money, how sad, how tragic. I hope you would have a problem with that. I would have a huge problem with that. Good. But remember, if everything's relative, if everything's subjective, it really doesn't matter whether I'm out here because people are paying me lots of money. Because it's all just a matter of opinion. It does matter because we need to progress as, as a human race. And if you were out here just doing that and you didn't believe in what you were saying, and you were just doing it for greed, you're hindering the progression of the human race. I'm not hindering anybody. No, I'm, saying, I'm, not, I'm making I'm not money for my family and myself. So if I'm out here motivated by a bunch of people paying me millions of dollars, come on, you know very well that that's good for me because I'm getting a lot of money. Something wrong with that? Yes, there is, is your point, and I agree with you, Justin. Why? Because if my motive out here is to communicate Christ and God, and it's not motivated by love for you, instead it's motivated by the fact that someone's paying me a lot of money, how trite and superficial is that? See, Justin, what you and I are beginning to see is motives do matter, goodness is not relative, and if I stand here saying, well, it's just fine, the reason I tell you about Christ is because someone's paying me millions of dollars to do it. It's kind of sad, isn't it? You see, objective good is real, Justin, isn't it? And you would not accept me standing here talking to you about Christ if the truth was that someone's paying me millions of dollars to do it. Okay, but how does this relate to the question I asked about a divine plan and why suffering's allowed? It seems like you're skirting around that. Okay, here's why I'm not skirting around it. Because if there is no God, suffering happens. But if there is a God, why would he allow that? That's my question. Okay, right. But you see, what you've got to acknowledge first is the very fact that you're so indignant about suffering points you to God's existence. Sure it does. It's very simple. See, and this is what you got to grasp. And we, we got to, you know, I'll try so long and then I'll go on. But if there is no God, objective morality does not exist. Why? Because if there is no God, there's no mind prior to the human mind that defines right and wrong. In other words, who defines right and wrong? The human mind. Exactly. We do, if there is no God. So you might say it's naughty for you, Cliff, to preach Christ out here, motivated by someone paying you millions of dollars. But that's just your opinion. My opinion is it's a great way to provide for my family and me. You might say that raping, date rape is wrong. But if I say I have a very high testosterone level and I've got a raper, then I'm right for myself. You see the relativism? No, because that causes harm to someone else. So what? According to you. According to me, it brings me a great deal of pleasure. So therefore, date rape is fine. Because it's all relative. We have a collective sense of morals. Great. Collective, they're, right? They're ever-changing. Yeah. Which is why a lot of the things in the Bible we no longer practice today because our morals are ever-changing depending on society's values. I mean, we right. I mean, I can't find someone out here who's a virgin and rape her and pay her dad 50 silver and have her be my wife anymore. That's not, gonna, that's not acceptable. That's not the issue right now. We're not talking about the Bible. The Bible's not part of our discussion right now. The discussion is I'm just saying, I'm suffering just is evil. Really? What do you mean evil? Well, from your perspective, it might be evil. From my perspective, it might be good. And if you're going to be consistent with your worldview, you're going to have to say, Cliff, you're right. From your perspective, it's right. From my perspective, it's wrong. But what is right and wrong? It's totally relative, totally subjective, just a taste. Like, do you prefer beans or broccoli? Do you prefer Coke or Pepsi? It's a taste. And so do you prefer date rape or not date rape? It's a taste. 
Do you prefer abusing innocent children or not? Just a taste. But with one of those, you're causing harm to another human being. With Coke and Pepsi. So I what? I can recognize that's a preference. So what if you're causing so harm to an accidental collection of atoms? You step on grass and kill grass. So why not step on a human being and kill a human being? Why not? Because it's in our nature to progress as a species. Great, Justin, that's wonderful. Maybe it's in your nature, it's in my nature to step on people. Are you gonna tell me I'm wrong? Based off society's values, yeah. Oh, really? What happens if you live in Nazi society? What happens if you live in white South African society? What if you live in the time of the Dred Scott decision in the United States? What do you do then, Justin? And those are those society's values. Like I said, they're ever changing. Fine. Then morality's relative. It changes based on society changing. Which means if society says that black folks are three-fifths the value of white folks, then that's true. Baloney, Justin, you know better than that. You know that even if society says black people are inferior to white people, that society is wrong. That's what Dr. Martin Luther King understood. Just because society says something, doesn't make it right. That's what Gandhi understood. Just because my society says that the caste system is right, doesn't make it right. And a lot of times, religion is to blame for those. No, now that's a different issue, Justin. Come on, don't get out of the kitchen. I'm, I'm, Stay in the kitchen. I'm right at the stove. No, you're not at the stove. I'm, I'm, not when you talk about then religion. I'm starting to We're forward. talking about a philosophical issue that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ or the Bible. I said religion, I didn't say Jesus Christ. It has everything to do with, is there a God or is there no God? If there's no God, Justin, then you define right and wrong, the culture defines right and wrong, the power elite define right and wrong. And right and wrong are totally relative depending upon the individual, depending upon the culture, or depending upon the people in power. King Arthur and his knights, or Adolf Hitler and his henchmen. Exactly, that's what I said. Okay, then why are you so upset as if it's an objective moral that suffering exists? Just realize that's your own bias. It's just your opinion. But you can't live that way, Justin, and I'm glad you can't live that way. You live your life as if Evil and suffering are real, and they're really wrong. Well, the only way that can be true is if there is some type of God to create and define justice, good versus evil, as objective values. And why is he not stopping it? That's what I've been asking you the whole time. That's the next question. We'll get to that, I promise. But do you see the first point now or not? I see your point of view of it. Okay, then don't take it from me. Read Friedrich Nietzsche, Albert Camus, Jean-Paul Sartre, the great French and German atheistic existentialist and nihilist philosophers. It's crystal clear.